Our scripture reading this morning is from Luke chapter 22. Uh, We're going to look at verses 39 to 46. Uh, Now, we're always uh, standing on holy ground in a sense when we come to reading God's Word. We read the Bible, but I think that that is especially apparent when we look at this passage. So let me invite you, if you have a Bible, to turn to Luke 22, verse 39, or if you want to use the uh, blue Bibles that are in the chair racks, then you can find it on um, uh, page uh, 1,122. That's 1122. And, uh, and then if you're able, uh, let me invite you to stand uh, as I read this aloud. And when I'm done, I'm going to make the declaration that this is the word of the Lord and invite you to respond by saying, thanks be to God. Luke chapter 22, starting at verse 39. And he, that is Jesus, came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. So a smaller section uh, today than the last few weeks. If you've been here with us over the last couple weeks, we've read much longer portions, just eight verses uh, today. But these eight verses, these eight verses, they continue what I think um, can rightly be called the most consequential 24-hour period in the history of the world. And these eight verses specifically within that 24-hour period recount an incident where your hope and mine for the future quite literally, and I don't think without exaggeration, hung in the balance. This is the dramatic decision point of that 24-hour day. I don't think that's an exaggeration. William Barclay wrote that there is no scene like this in all history, the very hinge and turning point in Jesus' life. This moment in the life of Jesus and in this prayer that he prayed is perhaps the most dramatic, the most tense moment in the whole account of his life. After this, after this, the events that are going to happen the rest of the day, they're, they're going to just kind of roll. It's, just, it's like they're just, going to, they're just going to keep happening. The events are just going to keep kind of, kind of, kind of ticking. But, but here is, here's a crossroads. What Jesus did here and how he prayed what he prayed proved and demonstrated that he was the only perfect man who ever lived. Now, here's the outline that we're going to follow. It is all about Jesus' prayer, and so we'll follow it from that standpoint. I think there are lessons for us as, as we pray, and I'll, I'll, I'll hopefully have a little bit of time at the, at the end to kind of apply it for our, for our own prayer lives. But really, we're talking about Jesus' prayer here. So there's the purpose of the prayer. We see that first. There's the content of the prayer. There's the battle of the prayer. And there are then lessons from the prayer. And now first, let's look at the purpose of the prayer. Remember that this, what we just read, is a continuation of what we've talked about the last couple weeks and a continuation of of specifically what we talked about last week, and that was Jesus' celebration of the Lord's Supper with his disciples, the the Passover meal with his disciples in the upper room. And that's what verse 39 is telling us, that this is a continuation. Jesus came out, it says, right? Came out from where? Where was he? Well, he was in the upper room of that house in Jerusalem where he had been eating the Passover meal with his disciples. That's where he came out from. He came out, it says, and went. Went where? Well, it says he went to the the Mount of Olives, which was outside the city of Jerusalem, right? Just to the east of the city across the the Kidron Valley. It was a place where the crowded city dwellers of Jerusalem would would place their gardens, and that's where Jesus goes. He goes. He goes to a garden, on the Mount of Olives. That's important, and we'll come back to that. Now, Luke doesn't give us the name, but we learn, we learn that it's a garden from the book of John, and we learn that it was called Gethsemane from the books of Matthew and Mark. All right, so here he is on the Mount of Olives in the garden of Gethsemane. Now, this was a place on the western slope of the Mount of Olives that would have had a view, a beautiful view, 
of the city. And it says that it was his custom to go there, right? So this was a familiar place. He had been there before. Now, why does he go there, right? Here's the purpose part. He goes there to pray. Now, we'll see that more in a minute, but he goes there to pray with his disciples, right? So there's a, there's a personal and a communal aspect to what he's looking to do. He wants to pray with his disciples. He had just eaten dinner with his disciples. Now he wants to go pray with his disciples, right, before he suffers. But what's the specific purpose of the prayer that he prays? He wants his disciples around him, but there is a specific mission that is in Jesus' prayer and Jesus' prayer alone. Right? What, is this, what, is, what is his specific desire? Now, prayer can have different emphases depending upon your situation. In the situation of Jesus and his disciples, they were about to enter into a period of significant suffering and significant temptation. Now, to vastly differing degrees, but nonetheless, an approaching of testing and temptation that awaited both of them, both Jesus and his disciples. And so Jesus gives them the specific purpose of the prayer that night. He says, pray that you might not enter into temptation. Now, from the disciples' standpoint, from their point of view, right, what could this temptation have been? What what, what might their temptations have been that night that Jesus would have been referring to? Well, most immediately, and and we see this is what ends up happening, right, the temptation to fall asleep instead of staying awake to support Jesus. Jesus wanted them around. He goes a little bit of a distance, just a stone's throw, it says, but still close enough to be within within view. He wants them around. He wants them to stay awake with him while he prays. He says, pray that you might avoid temptation. You might have just been talking about that. Or it could be the larger temptation to separate themselves from him, from association with him. Right? And that, that was going to come, that temptation. Are you with Jesus or are you not with Jesus? And the temptation could end up being kind of blatant running away. Right, which was the you know the 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 the, the what, what ended up happening to Peter, right? Well, he would flat out lies that he knows Jesus. Do you know Jesus? Do you know this guy? Nope, nothing to do with him. Right? Could be that kind of temptation, or it could be a more passive temptation, right? Just kind of running away and hiding, just sort of slipping away. This is what most of the other disciples did when Jesus was arrested, when he was being crucified. They just kind of slipped away. Now, in either case. Right? Or more, more likely, probably to some degree, in both cases, Jesus tells them to pray so that they wouldn't enter into this temptation. Not that they wouldn't face the temptation, but that they wouldn't be drawn into it, that they wouldn't entertain it and therefore fall to it. Now, Jesus knows that he's also there in a very real way when he says this, preaching to himself. Right? Because Jesus is about to face temptation. And this is how he intends to fight that temptation, to fight it with prayer. By running to his heavenly Father. That's what he's doing. So that's, that's the purpose. That's point number one, the purpose of this prayer. Now, point number two, and this is where we really begin to dig in, the content of this prayer. Look at what Jesus prays in verse 42. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Now, start with the cup. What's this cup? What's he talking about? What's that mean? Now here we really need, we really need the Old Testament here. We really need the Hebrew Scriptures here. All right, there's, a sense in which, there's a sense in which one's cup is just their, their assigned role in life. Right? It's, your, it's, it's, it's your lot. It's, your, it's, it's, it's just it's your assigned position, your assigned role in life. And it's not necessarily a bad thing in that sense. For example, in Psalm 16, David says, The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. And then he goes on to say, you hold my lot. The lines for me have fallen in pleasant places. There's a sense at times in the Old Testament where it's used like that, like in, in that psalm right there. Right? But there's another Old Testament usage that's far more prominent, and that is seeing the cup as a metaphor for God's judgment and God's wrath. Right? It's suffering to be sure, but it is suffering that is deserved, that the, that, that suffering that is the consequence of sin. That's what the cup is more more. more frequently referred to as in the in the old testament and i couldn't possibly read them all to you there's way too many references but for example let me just demonstrate this is isaiah 51 verse 17 wake yourself wake yourself stand up o jerusalem you who have drunk from the hand of the lord the cup of his wrath who have drunk to the dregs the bowl the cup of staggering you see 
Or Jeremiah 25, 15. Thus the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, Take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath. That's what Jesus is talking about when he's asking the Lord, if possible, could this cup pass from me? The cup of God's wrath that had been specifically assigned to Jesus as his portion. Because that's exactly what Jesus is going to face on the cross. If we understand the death of Jesus correctly and what was happening when he was, when he was executed, then we understand it, that it is not just like a simple common martyrdom or a tragic death that we just kind of say, oh, that's a shame. No, we recognize that this death that Jesus was about to suffer represented the wrath of God, God's judgment. That's the cup that Jesus was talking about. And his prayer is actually that the cup be removed from him. Can we remove this cup? Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Now, what are we to make of that? All right, because this almost, it almost looks bad for Jesus here. Seems like he's changing his mind maybe about going to the cross, that he's having second thoughts. And one of the ways, the most important, one of the most important ways to think about this is to understand the distinction between the divine nature of Jesus and the human nature of Jesus. Now, deep theology alert here. Eh, 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 sound the alarm, okay? I'll try to keep it simple, but this is very important. Because the early church fought really hard for centuries to try to get the wording just right and straighten this out. And many of the commentators point to this distinction as helping us understand how Jesus could note a difference in some way between his will at this moment and the will of the, the Father. There is, J.C. Ryle, to quote J.C. Ryle, there is a great and mysterious truth here that our Lord Jesus had two wills, a human and a divine will. And those two wills correspond to his two natures, his human nature and his divine nature. And we must state very clearly that in Jesus, these two natures, human and divine, are marvelously united, again to use Ryle's words, that these two natures, human nature, divine nature, they are marvelously united. He wasn't two persons. He was one person with two natures, united, inseparable, but distinct. The Westminster Shorter Catechism says it elegantly when it says, God and man in two distinct natures and one person forever. Now, that's the, that I think is a clear way to state it, but that does not mean that it's easy to wrap our minds around what that means. Right? And the questions about how that all fits together, the questions come much more easily than the, than the answers. But that is what is happening here. And it gives us some basis to say that while in his perfect divine nature... Jesus had a will that would not have been different from the will of the Father, but that in his perfect human nature, he might express a will that aligns with what we might expect a natural human response would be in that situation. And so when Jesus is speaking here, he is speaking out of his human nature. Now, I want to be very, very careful here. He is speaking out of his human nature, but he is still speaking perfectly. In other words, be careful not to take from this distinction between divine nature and human nature. Be careful not to take any idea that the divine nature is the perfect part and the human nature, as in this request that the cup would pass from him, is the imperfect part. That that part is not not equally perfect. And that might be the tendency here. Again, you go back to the original question that you might ask. Is Jesus wimping out here? Right? Changing his mind at the last minute? A failure of nerve? Okay, I get the divine nature thing, but in his human nature, is he, is he somehow not perfect here because he's, he's kind of backing away, he's wimping out? No, no. What he's doing here, and this is critical for us to understand, which is why I'm going to spend a couple minutes on this. What he's doing here is an expression of his perfect human nature. Not an expression that is simply understandable. Well, yeah, of course, he was under a lot of stress. We got to give him a little bit of, you know, a little bit of leeway here. No, no. This is an expression that we perfectly need him to have if he's going to be perfect. Now, before I show you that, let me make the problem even a little bit worse, right? By going to the third point, and then we'll kind of circle back, right? Because Jesus doesn't just make a statement 
about what's going to happen to him when he prays, right? It actually appears from verse 44, as he's praying, that he's in a deep battle with what's going to happen to him, right? It's tearing him up, right? It moves to point three, if you're following the outline, the battle of the prayer, right? Look at verse 44. Jesus is strengthened by an angel. He returns to praying, and it says that he's praying even more earnestly in agony. Now, don't go too quickly by that word agony. Don't just skip over that word agony. Agony. This is a Greek word found only here in the New Testament. For someone fighting battle, fighting a battle with sheer fear, it indicates a seriously traumatic event. And it says that Jesus was sweating, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Now, kids sometimes ask, kids you might ask, really, seriously, is it possible? Can we really sweat blood? Right? And some of you kids might be like, that's gross. And other of you kids might be like, that's cool. Is that what this is saying? Well, it does say that his sweat became like great drops of blood here. So it's possible that you can interpret this, that Luke was just sort of giving a, giving a metaphor here. He's just kind of saying, well, it wasn't actual blood, but it was like blood. Now, on the other hand, there have been ancient and modern cases of a condition where extreme stress causes the capillaries, the smallest of blood vessels closest to the surface, to, to, to dilate and to burst so that sweat actually mixes with the blood and it kind of comes out your, your pores. One way or the other, though, it absolutely demonstrates that what Luke is trying to explain to us is that Jesus is going through an extreme moment here. The stress that he is experiencing is huge. And like we already noted, this almost doubles down on the potential problem right right here, right? Here's where the problem comes. Because you may not be asking it, but lots of people have asked it throughout history. And a skeptic certainly would ask it. It would go like this, right? In fact, many of the world's major religions look at a verse like this and build their case from it that Jesus couldn't have been perfect. Certainly not great. Definitely not the Messiah. If he became so unglued, so completely unhinged at the prospect of dying. Right? Because look, I mean, crucifixion was terrible, no doubt about it. Right? More terrible a death than any of us could, could, could possibly hope to, to, to ever have to experience. Right? And there is no doubt in my mind that if I were coming face to face with the prospect of that physical death, that I would come, become completely unhinged. That would be me. But on the other hand, We also do have to admit that there have been accounts of Christian martyrs throughout the centuries where Christians have been led to torture and to execution where they seem to endure it without the same level of stress as Jesus seems to be experiencing here, with greater resolve, with a calmer spirit. And that's not just true of Christian martyrs. People often point out and kind of say, like, look, you can find other examples of people who seem to be far more courageous in the face of death than Jesus seems to be here, far calmer. Right? But here's the thing. Remember what we talked about. We're not just talking about physical death here, are we? What Jesus was looking at was the wrath of God, the weight and the punishment of sin. An old Puritan, Richard Baxter, put it like this. He said, Jesus' agony was not from the fear of death, but from the deep sense of God's wrath against sin, which he, as our sacrifice, was to bear. Right? Or here's, here, here's John Calvin. Right? Jesus had before his eyes the dreadful tribunal of God and the judge himself armed with inconceivable vengeance. It was our sins, the burden of which he assumed, that pressed him down with their enormous mass and tormented him grievously with fear and with anguish. That's what, in his human nature, Jesus was facing. In some mysterious way, separation from the Father, in a very real way. Now, this will happen in its full on the cross. That's when that, that, when that, that agony will be fully felt. But he's getting a taste of it now. It's, it's as if the Father is lifting the curtain so that he can glimpse what he's going to experience. And he's experiencing just a little taste of it now. And it's putting him in such agony that his sweat became like drops of blood. That's why Jesus is in, is, is in such anguish here. So don't you dare look down on Jesus and say that you think that you could have handled the approach, your approaching death with more dignity, with more serenity, with more calm. Because no one has ever been given a glimpse of the horror of the wrath of God like this and asked to endure it. 
And this is where we start to answer our problem or our supposed problem of Jesus' reaction here, where we begin to see that Jesus' response, the response of his human will, not just his divine will, that his response is not just simply understandable. Well, good, after all, you've got to give him a little bit of leeway. No, it's not just simply understandable. His response is perfect, and the way he responds is absolutely necessary because in order for Jesus to be the perfect substitute for me and the perfect substitute for you he needs to react to the consequences of sin and to the wrath of God in a perfect way think about this because this is exactly what Adam failed to do right that other garden remember that other garden thousands of years earlier the first representative of humanity the first Adam in the garden of Eden was given a glimpse of the wrath of God. God said, if you eat from this tree, this one tree, God told him, you will surely die. And in the, in the Hebrew, that phrase, surely die, is just a repetition of the same word. You will die, die. Right? In other words, sin is crossing the holiness of God. It is a rebellion that results in our eternal death. Not just die, but die, die. And Adam's response, when given a glimpse of the consequences of his rebellion against God, his response was not to recoil in horror, but to go on as if he didn't see anything at all. It was not the right response. The right response, the response of the perfect man, the response of Jesus, was to look at the wrath of God and to recoil in horror, to shudder at the prospect of God's wrath and God's justice. Jesus' response is not a weak response. It is the right response. It is the response that Adam should have had but didn't. It's the reaction of the perfect second Adam where the first Adam failed. Now, keep pushing this and keep asking questions because it gets even better, right? You could say, okay, fine, but why not just wait until Jesus was on the cross for him to get this glimpse of the horror and the, and the agony. Why give it to him now? Why in the garden? The reason, or at least I think a very good reason, is because it makes his response even more perfect. Right? What, what does Jesus say in verse 42 when it's clear that the suffering and the wrath of God is his cup to drink? He says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Now, like we said, right, this is a place where we see the distinction between Jesus' human will and his divine will. We see the distinction, but don't press that into a division because this is not a statement of opposition to the Father's will, but a statement of freely chosen obedience to the Father's will. And that's what makes it perfect. Because Adam, again, go back to Adam, back in that first garden, he did not choose freely to submit himself to the Lord when given the choice do this and live, do this and die, die. He had an opportunity to express his human will, and he did. And he chose against the Lord. But Jesus, in his perfect human will, has the same choice put in front of him, and he chooses with the Lord. Freely, obediently, perfectly. And that's the representative we need. We don't need the human will that chooses wrongly, like the first Adam. We need the human will that chooses perfectly as our representative, Jesus, the second Adam. And it is God's mercy to us that he shows us and he allows us to see this choice happening in the Garden of Gethsemane and not just later on the cross because it presses home to us that this choice, this choice to experience all of this was freely chosen. Because if Jesus had faced it on the cross, right, we'd be left to wonder maybe, well, I mean, what choice does he have now? He's on the cross. <laughs> I mean, you, you can't back out now. Right, he's already up there. Everybody's watching. But here in the garden, Judas hasn't come yet. No soldiers. No shackles. Disciples aren't even watching. They should have been, but they're asleep. Right? And Jesus could have just slipped away but he didn't (laughs) he stayed and he didn't stay in ignorance he stayed because he tasted what was coming and he chose freely perfectly to obey 
Jonathan Edwards, the great American theologian, philosopher of the 1700s, he really drives this point home. He says, God first brought Jesus and set him at the mouth of the furnace. Right? So take that image. Right? He takes Jesus, puts him right in front of the furnace, opens up the furnace. Right? Look. That he might look in and stand and view its fierce and raging flames and might see where he was going and then might voluntarily enter into it and bear it for sinners as knowing what it was. Jesus knew what he was choosing. He knew what he was doing. He knew what it would cost him. And as he should have, he recoiled in horror at the justice of God, and then he chose it anyway. Now, the last thing that I think drives this home is that this was truly the only way. Some of you remember, may remember a month or so ago on the Sunday of our congregational meeting, we looked at, this, at the, the phrase of our vision statement where we say that we proclaim and celebrate the eternal life, the transformative hope, the unshakable joy that comes only through Jesus, only through Jesus. That's what we looked at last month. And then we looked at the passage from, from John where Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. Well, when we read that in John 14, we made the point that Jesus clearly taught that he was the only way to the Father, that the only way to the Father was through him. That's what he taught. But here, here in Luke 22, it proves it. Because if there had been another way, if there had been any other way, this would have been the moment to discover it. Right? In fact, that's what Jesus was asking for. Could there be another way? some other option, perhaps some other path up the mountain to get to God. And the Father's reminder here to Jesus is that there is not. There is no other way. And the question is perfectly placed, perfectly recorded, so that you might have the perfect confidence that there is no way than your faith in Jesus Christ. Look, I know this is heavy. And all this talk about God's wrath and judgment and furnaces and all that kind of stuff, it can seem unpleasant. At the very least, it's extremely unpopular in the way that we talk in our culture today. But you need to see in this what Jesus is doing here. Right? His prayer, his agony, and his response. You need to see all of those things as the greatest, the most noble, the most perfect act of love in all of human history. Because if you say, well, I like the idea of the love of God, but all this talk about Jesus bearing the wrath of God, oh, I don't know, right? seems to take away from that somehow. Oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. Right? All this talk about Jesus the bearing the wrath of God, it does not take away from thinking about how much God loves you. It proves it. How do you know that the love of Jesus is real? Because at this moment... In this verse, where your salvation and the forgiveness of your sins hung in the balance, when Jesus faced the temptation to just simply walk away and let you bear the consequences of God's wrath on your own, when he faced the most agonizing choice that has ever been made at that moment, Jesus chose to love you when he could have run. He beat the temptation that Adam couldn't. When put into the garden, that garden, the Garden of Eden, Adam failed the test to be our perfect representative. You see that? When Jesus went to the garden, he proved himself to be that perfect representative. When Adam was warned about the danger of what hung on the tree, he failed. When Jesus was warned about what he would experience when he would hang on a tree, he answered the call. He drank the cup you deserve but couldn't bear. And he did it perfectly as the best, the most noble, the most loving man who ever lived. That's what you need to see in the Garden of Gethsemane. Which leaves me with insufficient time for this last point, but here are some lessons from this prayer. Let me just say this. What can you learn from all this about Jesus and, and, and uh, from, from Jesus' prayer about prayer, right? There is a model for prayer here in a sense, right? Let me just offer a couple of things. First, when you're in trouble, when you don't know what to do, where do you go? You go to God. 
That's what Jesus did. Even when, even when your will might seem at odds with what God's doing, be honest about it. The Father can take it. Go to Him. Second, when you're faced with a, a difference between your will and God's will, what do you do? Which do you choose? God's. Always God's. Right? You cannot look into the garden and conclude that God does not have your loving best interest in mind if you really understand what we were just talking about. You cannot look into the garden of Gethsemane and say, okay, God, I'm not sure if you completely have my best interest in mind. If you have a choice between God's will and your will, even if you don't understand what God's will might be leading to, choose God's, choose it always. All right? Pray like Jesus prayed and like Jesus demonstrated your will be done. Right? Trusting that God will answer your prayers in the exact way that you would want Him to if you knew what He knew and if you loved yourself as much as He actually loves you. That's how God will answer your prayers. Pray like that. God, your will be done. Do what I would want you to do if I knew everything you knew and if I loved myself as much as you actually love me. Third, when you're faced with your own failures, with your own weaknesses, right? what do you do? Right? Where do you go? <laughs> look at the, we didn't have time to get into it, but look at the reaction of Jesus when he finds his disciples sleeping. They failed him by, by failing to, to stay awake when he commanded them to. Right? Look at how he corrects them without crushing them. How he repeats that the reason he wanted them to pray was for their own good, that they might resist temptation. Fourth, last thing. When you're faced with your own death, when you look into the face of it, when God shows you that it's close, there is one thing that Jesus did that you do not need to do. Jesus looked into his coming death and he was deeply troubled. It sent him into agony. And you heard me say, clearly enough, I hope, that Jesus' reaction was perfect. He was not wrong. It was the right response, not just an understandable response, it was the right response. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, then it is the appropriate response for you. Because, no, because to refuse the payment of Jesus for your sins leaves you without a Savior, and that is a dreadful thought. But if you are a follower of Jesus, then Jesus' response does not need to be your response. You can look into the face of your own death, and your reaction can be different from the agony that Jesus felt. Because you will experience physical death like Jesus did, but because Jesus conquered much more than physical death, because he conquered eternal death, when you put your faith in him, you do not need to fear what awaits you. During the, um, the terrors of the communist rule in Romania in the last century, a Romanian pastor was having a breakfast with his wife, with his six small children, and the communist secret police broke into his home to arrest him for his faith, for illegally pastoring a Christian church. And the police asked him, don't you have anything to say? Aren't you afraid? And the pastor said, you're actually the answer to what we prayed today. We just read in Psalm 23 that God prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. And here we are eating and here you are. And the policeman replied, we will take you to prison and you will die there. You will never see your children again. And the pastor said, we also read about that today. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And the officer shouted at him, everyone fears death. Look, I know, I have seen the fear in their faces. And the pastor answered, a shadow of a dog cannot bite me, and a shadow of death cannot kill me. You can kill our bodies, you can put us in prison, but nothing bad will happen to us. We're in Christ. And if we die, we will he will take us to his kingdom. Jesus willingly took the real bite of death so that all that we need to experience is its shadow. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these deep truths that are so practical and real to us if we understand them. You did what we couldn't do. You obeyed the command that we didn't obey. You suffered the wrath that we deserved. So, Lord, allow us to see in that and any uncomfortableness that might come along with it the glories of your grace and mercy that is found in.
in your love for us displayed in that garden and then ultimately on the cross. Work in each of our hearts to be able to see that and to see it with clarity. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.